Good day, everybody. This is Chris of the Ancient Scholar, and today what I'd like to do is I'd like to spend a little time talking about uh, uh, reactive uh, drug metabolites. Uh, it'll be important as I continue on in the uh, the uh, biotransformation and molecular mechanisms of toxic toxicity class that I'm taking. Um, so I'm transitioning out of talking about enzymes, enzyme systems, and now we're going to talk about, okay, now that a substance has been through an enzyme system, uh, some biotransformation has been done, um, how can the metabolite of the original xenobiotic, how can that cause toxicity, damage, problems? And so today is just going to be a very broad, very general discussion as to how that can happen. And in general, the, the general, okay, just big picture here, um, the, uh, the metabolites will be electrophilic and they will attack nucleophilic sites on macromolecules within the cells. That's the general way of looking at a lot of your mechanisms of toxicity. Um, now, this is not the case when we talk about specific receptor targets, okay? These are molecules that can act as agonists, partial agonists, antagonists, partial antagonists for different receptors. Um, that type of reactivity uh, may be a little different than this, but really what I'm talking about here is how can metabolites cause the cell to undergo necrosis, okay, where it just dies, it just suddenly dies, um, from an inability to create energy or make proteins or what have you, it dies, it goes through necrotic changes, um, or perhaps um, apoptosis is induced, which is a is a the cell realizes oh, something's wrong here. I'm going to go ahead and just slowly shut things down, and and I'll get on out of dodge and kill myself. Basically, it's a, a programmed uh, cellular death, which generally doesn't tend to be as bad as as necrosis. And then how the basic mechanism of of metabolite uh, metabolite associated uh, mutagenesis is, uh, mutagenesis is mutations. So um, that's what I'm going to be talking about today, not necessarily receptors. I've certainly talked about a lot, a lot about how uh, certain xenobiotics and metabolites can interact with uh, receptors already. Um, so in general, when we talk about a a apoptosis, necrosis, and mutagenesis, or mutagenic changes, we're talking about an electrophilic metabolite. So electrophiles, if you remember from, from organic chemistry, electrophiles are substances that are, are, are areas of a substance uh, that tend to be um, electron deficient <clears throat> and tend to want to get a hold of, of electrons. Specifically, they tend to want to interact with a pair of electrons. Okay, so those are electrophilic or electrophiles. They're electron loving. However, nucleophiles are a little different in that nucleophiles uh, tend to have an area where there's maybe an excess of electrons or electron density. Um, and nucleophiles, because there's this excess area of electron um, density, um, tend to attract nuclei because nuclei in general tend to be positively charged. Um, so a, a nucleophile tends to be a lone pair of electrons. It can be some other things as well, as, as far as like a, a negatively charged ions, you know, uh, hydroxide anions and, and, and things of that nature. But um, a, good, a good starting point for understanding what um, nucleophils are, particularly when it comes to nucleic acids, where, where a lot of the concerns are when it comes to mutagenesis, uh, leading to carcinogenesis, neoplasms, cancer, etc., tends to be sites where you have um, lone pairs of electrons hanging out, and those lone pairs of electrons uh, tend to be uh, nucleophilic, um, and they can, so you have electrophiles attack these nucleophiles. Um, the electrophiles, of course, want to get a hold of those electron pairs, and then they can interact with the electron pairs. They can break chemical bonds and add and add um, adducts. Okay, like a covalent bond can occur, and you have this covalent adduct that's added, and then you break apart um, the nucleic acid, and you cause a mutation. And if that's a gene where you have a, a sequence, a you know a gene sequence for you know in, in, in DNA a molecule, um, <clears throat> I will say that we don't really have a good handle on what happens 
when this occurs with RNA, and I, I think you know RNA use essentially the same nucleic acids, a few modifications, but for the most part, it's the same nucleic acids. So you're going to have lots of um, uh, nucleophilic sites um, in RNA as you would DNA. But I don't know that it is a clear. It is as clear what what the consequences are of the RNA being damaged. Uh, my my intuition is it's not probably not nearly as bad because. If you have a bad section of RNA, you can just kind of get rid of it, and as long as the DNA that the RNA was copied from is okay, then you can just make another another copy. But really, it's when that template, when that DNA gets damaged, that you really run into lots of problems. So um, I just want to kind of take you through this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you guys here. Let me um, get this oriented perhaps a little better here as everything gets flipped um, backwards. Okay, so here we go. So this right here is a molecule of adenine. This, um, adenine is, uh, of course, uh, one of the bases that uh, is very important. A nucleic acid, so adenine, adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine, uracil, these kinds of things. Um, these nucleic acids, uh, the, these nucleotides. and um, This just happens to be one example. And I want to show you just how many um, of these nucleophilic sites you have. And basically you look... On these molecules, you basically look for any area where you have unpaired electrons. And um, typically on these particular molecules, let's see if I can maybe move that a little, a little easier to see there. Typically on these molecules, it's going to be areas where you have um, nitrogen atoms. Why is that? Well, remember um, nitrogen atoms um, specifically follow the octet rule. Which means that they are they're happy, they're stable when you have um, uh, eight electrons, which is four pairs of electrons. So um, let's just take uh, let's take this site right here for example. So if I look at this site, I have a double covalent bond uh, between the carbon and the nitrogen, and a single covalent bond here. So and you can look at a, a bond as a pair. You can look at a bond as a pair of electrons, at least a covalent bond. So I have two two electrons here. Two electrons here and two electrons here. It's two, four, six. That's six electrons, and I need another two electrons to meet my octet, which means um, that this nitrogen has a pair of electrons that are right here, all by themselves. They're not bound to anything. They're not interacting. So you just have a lone pair of electrons just kind of sticking out, going, "Ha ha ha! I'm going to attract you know something." And then you have some electrophilic molecule or metabolite floating around, going, "Ha! I want to get hold of those electrons and break this apart." And so you can see how easy um, that, that electrophilic attack of, of that nucleophile can have. Um, let's look and see if we have any other areas where um, we can have unpaired electrons. Um, let's look here. Let me flip this guy around here. Okay, so we identified this here as electrophilic. What about this nitrogen here? So I've got a bond, um, one, two, and then I have a hydrogen here. Um, which is covalently bound, so two, four, six. So I have a lone pair of electrons right here. And again, this is a site that can be attacked as well. Um, let's go over and look at this nitrogen here, uh, two, four, six. So again, I have a lone pair of electrons here. If we look at this nitrogen here, two, four, uh, six. And what do you know, I have a lone pair of electrons here. Um, let's look at this nitrogen all the way up here, this NH2 group. Um, I've got two, four, six, and wouldn't you know it, I have a lone pair of electrons here. So um, basically when it comes to adenine, uh, basically um, all of the nitrogens um, can be are, um, are nucleophilic to some extent and can be um, attacked uh, by electrophiles. This nitrogen here, not so much as the other ones. Um, but certainly all of these other nitrogens can be attacked by these electrophilic uh, metabolites um, and that can break the structure of that nu nucleotide up and, um, and that can br break the structure that can cause a, you know, a, a, a mutation, you know, maybe a point mutation. Maybe if you have lots of these electrophilic metabolites floating around, you can have lots multiple mutations and of course that's going to be uh, pretty serious. So that's kind of the basic underlying um, mechanism. You know we see this you know probably like the classic thing something like acetaminophen where uh, acetaminophen overdose um, 
the major pathways of acetaminophen, you know, I think it's a glucuronidation, which produce pretty inert metabolites, but the minor pathway um, produces the NAPQI um, metabolite, which is electrophile and can nucleophilically attack uh, hepatic cells. Um, generally have glutathione, you have your um, nucleophilic sulfhydro groups um, that glutathione, the cysteine, um, is able to um, attenuate those electrophiles by, um, by putting those, nu those uh, nucleophilic sulfhydryl or thiol groups into the mix. Um, but you don't have a whole lot of glutathione, and when glutathione becomes depleted, then you have all these electrophilic NAPQI molecules floating around, and they are electrophilically attacking um, nucleophilic uh, molecules or nucleophilic sites of molecules within your hepatocytes wreaks havoc and uh, causes lots of damage. So that's the basic picture when it comes to um, reactive metabolites. There are, of course, some other um, um, some other mechanisms that we'll talk about in more detail, but this is more of a big picture mechanism when it comes to um, reactive metabolites. They tend to be more electrophilic in nature. Okay, guys, I'm going to head and cut it off here. As always, thanks for hanging in there.